we were actually promoting Frack Nation in Pennsylvania, and we heard about the case, as you say, you know, it was, it was well publicized in Philadelphia, but not beyond that. And, you know, Phelan was there. He went into the courtroom, and it was like the Marie Celeste. Here mm-hmm. you have America's most prolific serial killer who did kill children born alive who cried and fought for their lives, were their very brief lives, and no one is there. They had a section of the court, and if people go to the GosnellMovie.com site, they can see the photograph of the courtroom. People, there was no one there. Phelan, who has covered crime in Northern Ireland, you know, did terrorism cases. He said drink driving cases in Northern Ireland got more coverage, had more journalists than America's biggest serial killer. And, you know, you know this story well, Eric. ABC News, NBC, C. BBC, MSNBC, no one showed up, and it was a decision. It wasn't an accident. It was a decision. Listen, over Christmas, I, my wife and I were just talking, and we, we just realized that the one thing that kept us awake at night and made, you know, that we always thought about and fantasized about was the Cosnell case. It wasn't the current projects we were working on. So we both we did the, the other thing you don't do in filmmaking is uh, we phoned the investors and told them to take their money back. Uh, that we weren't going to be working on those projects at the minute, and we're going to be working on the, on the Gosnell project. Yeah, and there's also public policy issues here that, uh, that, that, that deserve an awful lot of attention. Yes. And by the way, a Republican governor, a Republican governor was the one who said, hands off here, hands right. off and don't touch those abortion clinics. So for 17 years, nobody went across the threshold, despite the fact that two women died. Nail salons, according to the grand jury, nail salons in Philadelphia are better monitored for health uh, reasons than this clinic. How much is your script going to uh, cover the uh, prescription issue that uh, Gosnell was uh, selling prescription drugs? Well, I think that's a. I mean, if, if anyone's read the story of Gosnell, literally they were literally they were they were busting down his doors to find evidence of him selling prescription drugs or prescription, prescriptions actually, not prescription drugs, but he'd write prescriptions a pill mill. So they're going in looking for paperwork. You know, they're going for the filing cabinet. First thing they see is a blood-stained foyer with a flea-ridden cat walking through it. They go in, open the fridges, and there are ba- dead babies piled up high um, in cat food tins and plastic jars. Uh, they open in the kitchen where the people are having their sandwiches, they open the kitchen cupboards. And there are the plastic jars and the baby's hands and feet there. So that's a, I mean, that's a brilliant cinematic moment. You can just imagine these bored cops, uh, you know, at roll call in the morning. Oh, my God, I'm not going on that one. I, you know, I have a much more interesting hiding because they don't want to go on this boring case. And they accidentally stumble into the biggest serial killer in American history. You know, and so with this case... There were children, and there are photographs of them, as you probably know, Eric, in the grand jury report. There's baby oh, they were horrific. Baby, baby boy B, and he's the one, let's focus on him. He was so big, he was born alive, he cried, he fought for his life. He was thrown into a shoebox where his legs were so long that they fell out of the side of the shoebox. And Gosnell laughed as he killed that baby and said, this one's big enough to walk home with me. And there's one story that actually I, I think we could, could end up being the central story. There was one woman, a 27-year-old, who went for an abortion to Gosnell's clinic. She, it was a three-day procedure. The first day she went in, got, she said to Gosnell, what happens to the babies? And he said, we burned them. So she went home that evening. She felt really bad. She spoke to her cousin. And her cousin phoned, uh, phoned up Gosnell and said, we don't want to do this. We want to reverse this. His first reaction was, we're not, you're not getting your money back. By the way, you're $1,300. You're not getting your $1,300 back. And by the way, I don't do reversals. But thank God for those women's courage. They went to the local hospital, and that child is in a kindergarten today in Philadelphia. How old are you? And I could see that as the final scene in our film. Because we have to have some hope here.